Well, Shabbat Shalom. I just want to welcome everyone to the Sabbath Day Conference Call. We want to welcome all our family and friends that are here uh, and those of you that are watching the YouTube uh, recording. And we invite everyone that wants to know more about the world's oldest calendar to go to our website, LunarSabbathDay.com. You'll see a lot of articles and videos there. And uh, this is our title today, The World's Oldest Calendar. Well, you might have heard of some of these older calendars, like Egyptian, the Mesopotamia one, the Hindu one, the Babylonian. They're, uh, all the nations use lunar solar calendars uh, in all the ancient civilizations. And then there was the Roman Julian calendar, and that had an eight-day week. And then uh, in 1582, Pope Gregory established the Gregorian calendar, and maybe it's interesting for you to know that it is not an old ancient calendar. It's only 439 years old right now. So it's pretty new. So the world's oldest calendar has been discovered in Scottish fields. British archaeology experts have discovered what they believe to be the oldest calendar created uh, by hunter-gatherer societies and dating back to 8,000 BC. The Mesolithic monument was originally excavated in Aberdeenshire, Scotland by the National Trust for Scotland in 2004. Now analyzed by a team led by the University of Birmingham published today, that's July 15, 2013, in the Journal of Internet Archaeology says remarkable new light on the lunar solar device that predates the, fa the first formal time measuring device known to man found in the Near East by nearly 5,000 years. Until now, the first formal calendars appeared to have been created in Mesopotamia circa 5,000 years ago. But during this project, the researchers discovered that a monument created by hunter gatherers and Aberd Aberdeenshire, nearly 10,000 years ago, appeared to mimic the phases of the moon in order to track lunar months over the course of a year. Okay, and so this is in Warren Field, uh, the beginning of time is what they've titled it. Uh, the, this pit alignment also aligns on the midwinter sunrise to provide the hunter-gatherers with an annual astronomic correction in order to better follow the passage of time and changing seasons. Vince Gaffney, professor of landscape archaeology at Birmingham, led the analysis project. And he said, quote, the evidence suggests that hunter-gatherer societies in Scotland had both the need and sophistication to track time across the years to correct for seasonal drift of the lunar year, and that this occurred nearly 5,000 years before the first formal calendars known in the Near East. In doing so, this illustrates one important step towards the formal construction of time, and therefore history itself. And I'll leave all these links below for you. And this continues. Uh, Dr. Richard Bates of the University of St. Andrews said the discovery provided exciting new evidence of the early Mesolithic Scotland. He added, this is the earliest example of such a structure and there is no known comparable site in Britain or Europe for several thousands of years after the monument at Warren Field was constructed. So the Warren Field site was first discovered as unusual crop marks spotted from the air by the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland. And there's that link. So these are, this is some aerial views and then some views of these pits that were dug uh, to keep track of the lunar solar calendar and the movement of the moon in the sky. Antikythera, evidence of a lunar calendar. 
A number of years ago, a brass device was found in the Mediterranean Sea near an island named Antikythera. It was from a shipwreck at around the time of Yeshua. It was just a lump. It had been studied with x-rays. It is a wonder in itself. It is a kind of clock or computer that will calculate the time of the Olympics. It's not a clock, as it had no timekeeping or escapement mechanism. Therefore, it's, genera- it's, ge- it's a geared calendar computer. The Antikythera mechanism is generally referred to as the first known analog computer. The quality and complexity of the mechanism of the mechanism's manufacture suggests that it must have been undiscovered predecessors made during the Hellenistic period. Its construction relied on the theories of astronomy and mathematics developed by the Greek astronomers during the second century BC, and it's an estim- and it is estimated to have been built in the late second century BC or early first century BC. This artifact was among wreckage received retrieved from a shipwreck off the coast of the Greek island of Antikythera in 1901. In, on the 17th of May in 2002, it was determined to, uh, as containing a gear by archaeologist Varios Stas. The device, housed in the remains of a 34 centimeter by 18 centimeter by 9 centimeter wooden box, was found as one lump. Later, separated into three main fragments, which are now now divided into 52, uh, 82 separate fragments after conservation efforts. A team led by Mike Edwards and Tony Freff of Cardiff University used modern computer X-ray tomography and high-resolution surface scanning to image inside fragments of the crust of the crust encased mechanism and read the faintest descriptions that once covered the outer casing of the machine. This suggests that it had 37 seven meshing bronze gears enabling to follow the movements of the moon uh, and the sun through the zodiac. It predicted eclipses and to model the irregular orbit of the, mo- of the moon, where the moon, uh, higher in its pedigree than its apogee. Here we can find a video, you can find a video of the Antithera Medicanism, episode 10, Evidence of a lunar, lunar Calendar, and the link is here below. I encourage you to go and watch it. Fascinating video. The front calendar ring. Notice the front calendar ring on this shows shows it has multiple rings, each one divided and moving separately, indicating the motion of a heavenly body. So it, uh, the first moving ring is the zodiac ring. Each interval is one degree, giving an implied total of 360 uniform divisions in a full circle as one might expect. Each interval is actually 1.01695 degrees, giving an implied total of 354 uniform uniform divisions in a full circle. The calendar ring on the outside has 29.5 divisions and the zodiac ring has 30 divisions, showing a slight variance between the two rings. These two rings show that the 29.5 is a 354 divisions per per, uh, full circle. 
the conclusion arrived. The, science, the physical evidence does not support the mechanism having a 365 division calendar ring. Therefore, we must set aside the notion that the front dial calendar ring of the Antikythera mechanism is a representation of the, so, uh, the so-called 365-day Egyptian civil calendar. Nevertheless, given that the feature clearly is a calendar, an alternative proposal is needed, and we find 354 and 360 as the, most, as the two most likely division candidates based on the pre, uh, precedent of known calendar systems. Both division uh, candidates may be considered lunar in, char char in character, 354 days, explicitly so, and 360 implicitly, assuming the concept of 12 normally full 30-day lunations, based on the significant finding for 354 holes matching the extant interhole distance, the confirmation of others' measurements and our own measurements of the calendar and zodiac ring markings we interpret the 354 divisions as the most likely of these two division candidates and propose that the front calendar, excuse me, the front dial calendar ring of the Antikythera mechanism is, 300, is a 354 day lunar calendar. Remember that this is from the time of Christ. Highly complex, advanced scientific. Um, computer of the age is lunar in, in function. Okay, so we've uh, discovered several ways that people kept uh, the track of the lunar calendar, and uh, most of them are through nature, but we did see a machine here that would calculate it, and so we're going to go forward with more of nature's calendar. The first people. Okay, I've got a question. What calendar did the Cherokee use? And the answer, the Cherokee calendar is traditionally defined as a lunar calendar. And are the Cherokees uh, from the lost tribes of Israel? And did they keep the calendar given to Israel? Well, if one American geneticist is correct, the list of groups known to make up the 12 tribes of Israel may need urgent updating. According to Donald Yates, there is compelling evidence that within the Cherokee Nation of American Indians, mothers and other matrilineal forebears bear bona fide Middle East Jewish genetic markers. The essence of my findings is the quote is that the Cherokee have had families of Jewish heritage in their midst since before Columbus and that early Jewish traders married Cherokee women to cement their ties with the tribe, Mr. Yates says. He studied the DNA of 67 Cherokee test subjects and distributed them into haplogroups, groups, genetic populations with a common ancestor. He chose to focus on matrilineal descent in order to filter out the latter. Colonial era admixture, parentheses, the Cherokee came into contact with mostly with colonizers from Spain and England during the 16th and 17th centuries. So Mr. Yates found that almost one quarter of the 67 were haplogroup T, a group not usually found among Native Americans and which is more common to the Middle East, specifically Iran and Iraq. And here's the link below. Many people have expressed the fact that the Cherokees resemble the Jewish population. Indeed, my own visits into Cherokee, North Carolina, seems to confirm this. Unfortunately, the sampling of the DNA appears to be incomplete. Cherokees have high levels of test markers associated with the Berbers, Native Egyptians, Turks, Lebanese, Hebrews, and Mesopotamians. 
Genetically, they are more Jewish than the typical American Jew of European ancestry. Okay, the Lost Tribes of Israel. This is a whole uh, article about the buried wall in Bradley County that attracted nationwide interest. This was in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and the material can be found in the Cleveland Library in Tennessee. So the Lost Tribes of Israel, and this is uh, just, uh, just a screenshot of the articles, and I'll leave the exact um, how to find them at the library uh, below in the link below. But anyways, this is 1920, this article, the Lost Tribe of Israel inhabited a section of Bradley County more than 4,000 years ago. So uh, in investigating this, you're going to find out that they did have Hebrew roots. This ridge on the Hooper Farm, okay, this was over 4,000 years ago that this ridge was probably uh, developed. Uh, but anyways, this Hooper Farm uh, is there in Bradley County. And it was discovered that he had these large trees up there and he wanted to go up and develop that farmland up there by that ridge. Well, then he saw these big flat iron rock that had Indian writing on it, which wasn't too uh, unusual for that area to find things with some Indian writing on it. But then um, he found that um, there was more to it. There was more on that ridge. And so um, this, what happened was this uh, archaeologist was listening to him talking about this ridge and those rocks and these flat iron shaped uh, rocks that he had found up there with all this Indian writing. And he was listening to him telling his friend, Mr. Hooper was telling his friend in a restaurant. And he was sitting in the booth there behind him. And he come over and he said, can I go up and look at this ridge. I'm really interested in this. So, okay, well, the ridge had huge trees that were three feet wide and stone markers shaped like a flat iron were every 50 feet. And the stone wall was 700 foot formation and it was three feet thick. It was built of three ply stone that was 10 inches thick all of which was inscribed with hieroglyphics of the ancient Hebrews. Each character was three to five inches tall, and they cited the book of Deuteronomy, all in Hebrew, ancient Hebrew writings. And remember what the book of Deuteronomy says when they go into the land that they are to write the law down on these stones and so that is what they did and here's the quote that they had on their wall from Deuteronomy 27. Deuteronomy 27 and Moses with the elders of Israel commanded the people saying keep all the commandments which I command you this day and it shall be on the day when you pass over the Jordan into the land which Yahweh shall thy Elohim giveth thee that you shall set up the great stones, and a plaster them with plaster, and thou shalt write upon them all the words of this law. And when thou passest over, that they mayest go into the land which Yahweh our Elohim giveth thee, a land that floweth with milk and honey, as Yahweh Elohim of your fathers hath promised thee. Therefore it shall be, when ye have gone over the Jordan, that ye shall set up these stones which I commanded this day in Mount Ebal, and you shall plaster them with plaster, and, they sh and thou there shall thou build an altar unto Yahweh your Elohim, an altar of stone. Thou shalt not lift up any iron tool upon them. Okay, so they did what they were commanded uh, um, by Moses. And they wrote the book of Deuteronomy on that wall that's 700 foot long, and it has three layers uh, that are 10 inches thick. And also they had a special plaster on them that they wrote this, all uh, the Hebrew writings in the three inch tall letters. 
it was a special plaster that was not from that area. So we'll go a little further, and I will leave these links below that you can go to the library and look that up. I think, I don't know if you can find that all online, but I had these uh, copied, and um, these are the actual newspaper printings. So upon the uncovered surface of the discovered wall is the imprint of a sole of a foot 13 inches long. Hieroglyphics are on the ball of the foot. This imprint is symbolic of the faith the Israelites had in the promise of Moses because he said everywhere they went, where their soles of their feet would be, that that would be theirs, even uh, to the utmost sea. And here is the chapter and verse. Deuteronomy 11, verses 22 through 24. For thou shalt dil diligently keep all these commandments which I command you to do them, to love Yahweh your Elohim, to walk in his ways, and to cleave unto him. Then Yahweh, then will Yahweh drive out all these nations from before you, and ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. Every place wherein the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours, from the wilderness of Lebanon, from the river the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea, shall your coast be. Yes, over here, that's America now, would be an uttermost sea, far, far from them. And this is where they claimed their property, and they wrote the law of Deuteronomy. So which calendar did the Cherokees use? The calendar that's in the heavens the one that Jehovah gave to all 12 tribes of Israel. When he said in Exodus 31, 13, and 17, he said, Say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbath. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come, so that you may know that I am Jehovah, who makes you holy. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever, for in six days Jehovah made the heavens and the earth, and the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So I believe the Cherokees are one of the lost tribes of Israel, and they kept his calendar. The calendar in the heavens is the world's oldest calendar. In the beginning, the calendar was placed in the heavens. Genesis 1.14 says, And Jehovah said, Let there be light in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And that is a calendar description. Psalm 19, 1-4 The heavens declare the glory of Yahweh and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. So um, don't forget to go to our website, LunarSabbathDay.com, to access materials directly related to this calendar that's in the heavens. We invite you to go there. And if you want to uh, fellowship with us, you can always go to the events page and scroll to the bottom and find out when we meet uh, for discussions like this today. So we just want to uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Brother Pete, for being my co-host. And this is Barbara signing off for today.